There's a soft, southerly breeze blowing across the harbor. It carries a hint of summer. But there's a coolness too, a reminder of the winter just passed. It's the first week in June, and the late spring rituals are underway. Mending nets, getting ready for the trap fishery. Most times, it's a leisurely task, because in most places, the fish don't come till late June. Most places, maybe, but not here, in Seldom, on the south side of Fogo Island. This crew was anxious to finish the job and get their trap back in the water. While most places will have to wait two or three more weeks for the trap season to start, in Seldom, it's already three weeks old. Steaming out into a bright, hazy dawn, heading for the trap grounds with Jack Rowe and his crew from Seldom. When does the trap season start around here for you fellas? Around the 10th and 15th of May, like that. It's all kind of the hoods, you know. So much ice this year? Yeah, there was a lot of ice, but it never played too bad on weed, eh? You're fishing from early in May, but when is the best one to fish? Well, uh, things have changed. It always be July, so June, July. It seems like when the cape one comes now, we lose weight on this side down. So when the cape one come in, the fish leave the south side of the island and go north, is that what you're saying? That's what it seems like. That's odd. Not like it used to be years ago, it would be load and go when the cape one would come. How have you been doing so far this year? Well, very good. Seems like uh, the fish strike in here before they strike in anywhere else, is that, that seem to be the case? That seems like this side down, yeah. Yeah. You fellas are the first to be added in the air, are you? Yeah, put it in the always first. Sure, yeah, right up there, Alec. You pin on up there, come back here. Jack, is this a hard, is this a hard spot for tides? Yeah. What's the... Uh, yeah, worse. What's the problem? Eh? I said, what's the problem with the... Goes in under the boat, you know? Yeah. I can't let go of me kind of, no? The deck is all up there. But you say you, you, you still pick the spot, even though it's sometimes hard to pull a trap here, right? Oh, yes, yeah. Why is that? Well, like you step in his blood, I suppose. Huh? <laughs> well, like you step in his blood, I suppose. But it's a good spot for fish, though, you're saying, isn't it? Oh, yes, yeah. Does he do pretty well here? Oh, pretty good, yeah. This morning's haul, 5,000 pounds. Not bad, but Jack says it'd be better if the weather was a little worse. There's all the kind of weather here. It's the civil, well, we don't get no fish civil summers. We want rough water. <laughs> that's an odd thing to hear from a fisherman. Yes, it is. <laughs> we want it rough on that side down where you fish What's a good season for you fellas in terms of landings? Well, years ago, it'd be always seven, eight hundred in the towers. But now the fish have got scarce, so it seems like it's coming back in now, this year especially. Mm -hmm. He may not get a thousand kentles this year, but no matter. Jack's just happy the trap fishery is back. Just a few years ago, 
it seemed the trap fishery and Fogo Island were finished. But more about that later. Right now, there's lots of action a short distance from Jack's boat. The Penny family, another crew from Selden, are hauling their trap. There are eight in the crew altogether, seven brothers, and their father, Skipper Glenn Penny. Seems they're doing pretty well too. While the boys dip the fish aboard, I had a short chat with their father. Skipper, you got a, a family operation here, have you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I said it looks like all my own boys. How many of them are there all together? Seven. Seven brothers. That's a good, good family crew you got. Yeah, very good. How, how are you doing with fishing this year so far? You look like you're doing pretty good today. Yeah, extra, sir. Extra good. We started the uh, 17th of May. That was our first hour. We had 20 barrels. I haven't went much under that since. That is about uh, 6,000 pounds, isn't it? 8,000. 8,000 8, 8, pounds. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. How's that compare with other years? Oh, extra land, you know, better now than being 10, 12, I don't know, 15 years. You're an old hand at it, I suppose, are you? Well, I. Oh yes, I've been at it ever since I've been 17 or 18. Perhaps a bit before that. It started with the hottest. Down there in the same place where we're doing at. So you're doing pretty well, I guess? Yes, not too bad at all. If it keeps it up, sir, it looks like the shaping up now for a very good summer. And most of our lands are getting a fine lot of fish. Better than they've done for years. Better than they've done for years. Somewhere else, that might be just an offhand remark by an excited fisherman. But here on Fogo Island, it has special meaning. Back in the mid 60s, the trap fishery here hit rock bottom. The fish buyers left the island. Resettlement seemed inevitable. That's when the people of Fogo Island took charge. They took over the plants on the island including the one in Seldom. They formed a cooperative. Everyone on the island had a share. They caught the fish themselves, processed it themselves, and found their own markets. And it worked. Slowly, the trap fishery came back. And together with a new longliner fishery on the north side of the island, it meant the survival of Fogo. The spirit that carried Fogo through those tough times can be seen here at the wharf in Selden. Everyone pitching in. Everyone enthusiastic. It's meant there's a future here, especially for young people, like the Penny Brothers we saw a little earlier hauling their trap. I caught up with one of the Pennies on the wharf in Selden. Kevin, you had a good bit of fish there this morning when we were talking with uh, with your father. That's right, sir. We had, we had 17 barrels this morning. And you went back and hauled a second trap afterwards. How'd you do there? We had about 15. Not weighed off yet. We had about 15 barrels. 15 evening. barrels, no. So it's 300 pounds in barrels we found out from your father That's this morning. 300 pounds split and 400 in and got it. That a, was that a good day's fishing? Yes, it was a very good day's fishing. Made up 30 barrels, it's about. Yeah. Good day's fishing. This time of year, I mean, this is early June. Is that uh, just about, about your average this yeah. time of year? Middle of May, first week in June. Best time fishing around there. Seldom in here. It's a pretty busy spot here when you come into the wharf, isn't it? Yes, when all the boats get sent at the same time it is. Sometimes you'd have to wait to get unloaded. 
If you're lucky enough to get to one of the houses, you'll do okay. All hands are pitching in back at the uh, splitting tables. Oh yes, just about two crews. What's the system when you come back in out of the wharf? Um, do you always go in and split your own fish? Yeah, most usually we always split it, but if it's a nice bit of fish on the go, we'll probably sell half it in and got it, so that you can get away quicker for the evening now. Mostly split. What's the advantage now to uh, splitting your own fish? Mm, you get a better price for it. It's 36 cents a pound for a large split, and we'll only get 22 if you sold in and got it. So it's worth your while splitting? Oh, yes. It wasn't so much that the fish was being split, it was who was doing the splitting. Teenagers, alongside the old hands. Young people learning what's becoming a dying art in many parts of Newfoundland. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. And I think that if there was uh, more ability to split in some other parts of the island, of course, it would mean more salt fish uh, for the salt fish corporation to handle. But I think if, the, if there was that ability in certain other areas of the island, for example, in the Avalon Peninsula, then I think that the glut uh, might not be what it appears to be in past years. You're even training people, uh, young people, to, uh, to work as, as splitters. Yes, we, uh, as you said, it's a, a dying art and we don't want to lose it and it's going to mean uh, uh, more employment for people and that's the other thing we have to contend with here, an up and, grow, up and coming workforce. Uh, so it's essential to us and also it gives the fisherman an opportunity to sell more head on gutted fish, which means that he can fish a little bit more uh, in a given day, two hours, or whatever the case would be, particularly if he's uh, a baited hook fisherman. Most of the fish landed and seldom goes into salt cure. So does the fish landed at three other co op plants in Deep Bay, Tilting, and Fogo. But the co-op also produces fresh fish. That part of the operation is centered here, at the co-op's plant in Jobat's Arm. Fresh cod, turbot, and flounder are processed in the Jobat's plant. Up until last year, the co-op marketed this product through one of Newfoundland's big fish companies. But in 1983, they took a gamble. They came up with their own brand name, Ocean Select, and decided to go it alone, instead of using a middleman. This year we decided that wasn't the best way to go. We've developed our own brand, our own label, and we intend to do it ourselves. And so far that seems to be working quite well. All our frozen fish uh, up until this year has gone into the U.S. market. Uh, uh, some of it this, this year may go into a Canadian market, but we're still in the early stages of marketing, but it looks quite good at this point. It seems that uh, uh, even though we've been tied into one of the major fish producers uh, marketing uh, for the last two years, we, we have made, made an impression in the marketplace with, with quality. How has the co-op been making out in relation to the, the tough times that the fishers have been having all over? Uh, so far we've been managing to survive. Of course, we're uh, obviously uh, controlled by the conditions in the industry, the market. We, we sell in the same market as everybody else. We, by the same fish as everybody else, so obviously it's going to affect us, but we're managing. Nineteen eighty three saw another first for the Fogowalan Co op. A crab fishery was opened up on the north side of the island. Three longliners were licensed to catch the crab. One of the three, the Notre Dame Venture out of Fogo. The Notre Dame Venture is owned by Morley Rowe. He bought her three years ago for seining, herring and mackerel. Before that, Morley and his crew fished cod with gillnets and traps. They've been fishing crab for about a month now. It's all hit and miss, picking their way around the grounds. 
finding the crab by trial and error. Why did you decide to get a, a crab license in the first place? Well, the, 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 the license was, was, was going to be issued in this area, so we uh, decided we might as well get into dry, you know. Heard tell it was two dollars into it, it'll get straightened away at it. Make a few dollars at it, so we hope enough we got one. You or any of your hands have any previous experience doing this kind of work? None whatsoever, no. No, so we just stared on our own. We might be at this the wrong way, I don't know. It appears to be working on it, you know. The decision to open up a crab fishery in this area was made after a number of studies by federal fisheries. Oh, they've, they've done experimental work here for the past, from the date on it in 81, 82, and I think in 83, they've been experimenting there with crab boats, checking the stocks to see what stocks is there. You know, they found out that they could have a commercial fish here, so they issued, uh, they issued the tree license for that. So how many uh, local fishermen applied uh, looking for those well, licenses? I think there was somewhere around 20 or 25 in the first start. And there were so many screened out that their, their boats were suitable. I think then there was 10 or 12 boats left in the draw. Yeah, around 12 boats in it. And you were the one of the lucky three? Well, I was one of the three. <laughs> but don't you consider yourself lucky? I always well, thought... I guess, you know, so far now, we haven't had much of a chance, you know, we haven't been into the fishery very long, but it seems to be, uh, it seems to be getting all right. You're doing, you're doing pretty well at it so far. Well, we, we're, like I said, we're averaging uh, 8,000 a day, so 8,000 pounds uh, a crab a day, 43 cents a pound, you know, you're doing fairly well, you know. In regard to the fishery itself, you know, it's not, it's not that interesting to me, not, not uh, as far as catching it, you know, it's only interesting thing with this now is the money. <laughs> I'd sooner say, be saying in Cape or saying in Herring. Why is that more exciting? I, yeah, it's more interesting. You know. It cost $80,000 to outfit the Notre Dame Venture for crab fishing. But as long as the catches and the price stay good, Morley and his crew are happy with their move. It's not there to work for this, is to, to uh, get them in their trap, you know. This, uh, the hours are a bit long. They're on a lot of gear, you know. But, but, uh, apart from that now, it's, uh, it's not hard work at all, you know. So how many fleets do you have, and uh, how much gear do you have? We've got uh, 800 pots. We've got use in, thir in 13 strings, 13 fleet. How did your crew like it, dude? Oh, they're all, they're all satisfied with it. Are most of them, uh, you know, fishermen, uh, cod fishermen like you were? Yeah, they were gale netting and trapping, you know, inshore fishermen, you know, same as us. But if they're making good money, you know, they'll be, they'll be satisfied. When the crab fishery opened off Fogo, three boats, were supposed to supply the co-op. But one of the skippers had a falling out with the co-op and ended up selling his crab elsewhere. That leaves just the Notre Dame Venture and one other boat landing crab on Fogo. I think the, the, the plan can keep going with uh, the amount of crab that's uh, going to be landed in Fogo, the, the landings you've been getting? Uh, well, no, it won't, it, won't be, uh, it won't be going at full capacity, I don't think. I don't think two boats can handle gear enough, you know, in a day to, to keep her going full capacity. I, I, they'll probably issue another license, or you know, that's what I'm half expecting now that they'll issue more another license, probably at two more. You must have mixed feelings about the <coughs> possibilities of new licenses being issued, eh? Well, I mean, the, the fisheries know us if, if the stocks can stand more boats. Well, if they can, they'll issue the license. Well, if they can't, you know. Probably better to leave it like it is.
Right now, the Fogo crab boats are working within sight of land, only seven or eight miles out. So far, there's lots of crab. But Morley is resigned to the fact that the landings will dwindle, and they'll have to go as much as 50 or 60 miles out, like the crab boats on the Avalon Peninsula. How long do you think this can last before you have to go farther out, like the other crab boats are doing out of the Avalon? Oh, we'll probably get a season or two. Probably now in the middle of this season we may have to move off from here. We, we got the boats, we're prepared to, to move off. You know, we got the boats to do it. It was a year of gambles for the Fogo Island Co-op. Gambling that it could make it in the crab fishery that it could catch and process enough crab to make a dent in that profitable market. Gambling on its own brand name and going it alone in the fresh fish business. And on top of that, gambling that they could do all this and meet the everyday costs of operating the co-op. For a while last fall, it appeared the gamble had backfired. The co-op ran out of money. Sales were slow, inventories were high. Finally, the provincial government came through with a bank guarantee of $700,000. The crisis passed. The co-op breathed easier. But crises are nothing new to the people of Fogo. They remember the late 60s, when their community nearly disappeared. And they remember how they kept it alive by forming the co-op. That's why, in bad times as well as good, they remain loyal to the co-op. Like these longliner men in Joe Bat's arm, just back from three days fishing on the Funks. Don Decker and his crew will eventually have to go to Labrador when the cod move north. But they'll wait till the last minute. They want to keep the Joe Bats plant going and the people working for as long as possible. How long have you been at it now? When did you start? We started off in May this year. We were later the year. Last year we started off, I think it was the 19th of uh, April last year, after we brought the boat and That's a new boat to us. So we fished until July and then we went up to Labrador, up to McCovic. Fishing up at the McCovic Dumb Well up there. We got a lot of cod up, mostly all, all cod up in McCovic. And, uh, well, now the year we did it was later, though, you see, we had never got at it. We never got at it for May, sometime in May, before we got at the year. But there was good fishing when we started off. You'd prefer to stay here if you could? Oh, I, yeah, go, right. Go to Labrador. Oh, yeah, it would be better. It would be better for everybody in general, eh? You're home all the time, but down there you're away from home, and you've got a lot of old work to do. You don't get nothing done. you got to do your own cooking and your own washing. you got to do it all. But it's not only that, but it's keeping this plant oh, going. Oh, yeah, this plant. Well, this plant needs the boat, see, to keep her going. And this is the, without this plant and there are co-op, there'd be no coke oil. There'd be nothing to it. And this is what got to keep her going, is those long liners. Because only a bit of trap fish, and that only for a little while, and that's out. But this uh, long liner business, that's good until October, November, month, October anyway. The ground fish, with them, with them, without these boats, why they're going to be tough. And everybody got to have a living, so you got to look out to the other folks as well as yourself. So no good for you to go be number one all the time, and the other poor fellow not getting nothing. <laughs> 